look back in hindsight Everything is 2020 In hindsight You make mistakes, we're learning from this In hindsight be your today and your tomorrow In hindsight It's so much clearer now Imagine stepping into a world of corporate chaos and to emerge as a beacon of clarity and success. How do you transform businesses from the brink of collapse to flourishing entities? Well, today's guest, Regina Gobinas. Yes, now, you got it. Now I said Regina wrong. Did you notice that? I was so busy worried about you a second. There. Regina Gobinas <laughs> is a master of corporate restructuring and scaling, having helped over 100 companies find their path back to profitability. And with her natural skills and over two decades of experience, Regina's insights are a perfect fit for you, the audience of Hindsight, the podcast. Hey, good morning, Regina. How are you doing today? Good morning. I'm well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. So we've already established that we're both in the same time zone. Actually, we're both in the same state. So that's pretty amazing. I dragged uh, Regina out of bed to do this early morning interview, and I really appreciate you coming on and, and having a conversation with me and the listeners of Hindsight, the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to share this information. I think it's so needed, especially right now with so many businesses just kind of hitting a slump at the moment for, you know, for, for a lot of different reasons. But uh, I think it's going to be a very powerful conversation. I'm excited to really provide not just value, but tangible, actionable steps people can take immediately after the discussion, after they hear this discussion. Yeah. And just so we stay in, we're on the same sheet of music. Hindsight, the podcast is about decision making, is about our career journey and life journey. And it is about what you do and how you can influence others to help businesses to get on the right path. So Regina's going to give us a lot of good insight, but I'm going to be tapping you for some of that uh, personal things, you know, that you've experienced during your journey so that you can kind of convey that as well. So, yeah. uh, so Regina, just tell us a little bit about yourself. <sighs> Oh God, where do I start? Personal, business, work, where do I start? You know, uh, very blessed with God-given skills and abilities to understand people and money. I don't have formal training or education, but I do believe that God uses the available, not necessarily the qualified. And I was always the one running around with my hand up saying, I'll do this and I will try this and I will jump in the fire and I will do this and I will do all the things. And I think opportunities just kind of presented themselves. And uh, at 24, uh, got a job as uh, an accounts payable clerk at a company that was in the tail end of Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And my mentor at the time was helping them navigate the Chapter 11. Mm -hmm. And I just knew I had to walk alongside him. That feeling in your gut, you're like, I just... You're like, I know I'm not qualified for to touch anything in this in this sphere, in this area of, of, of anything. Like I should not even be coming close to it. But you just have this thing in you that keeps mm. telling you, I, I've qualified you. Like God's qualified you. You know, like th this is the thing. And I fought for my place for about six months. It wasn't just handed to me the opportunity to take on a client. I was 24. Yeah, no formal training or education. The English is my second language. I came here when I was 11. Mm. And school was just never my shtick. I, I couldn't understand the value, really. I'm not diminishing it. My kids are, my, my daughter is now in, in Boston University. So, but I just, I was hungry for life. Mm. And when I realized that there is a space of corporate restructuring that I had no idea existed, I'm like, wait a minute. I get to take a dying business where the family is on the line, where employees are on the line, when the CEO, and we know the CEO always holds the bag, their mm -hmm. leverage up to their eyeballs, their house is completely depleted of equity. They owe everything to, to everybody. Yeah. And they're still showing up to work and hustling every day. I'm like, that's my people. Mm. The courage that it takes to show up. And I'm like, this is, I wanna support this. This, this is phenomenal. These are incredible human beings. And, you know, you, should I tap into personal now or you want to some questions? Because there is a little bit of a... Yeah, give me, give me some personal. Let's go. Yeah. You know, uh, God is a funny guy. I ended up restructuring companies uh, basically my whole career. Now I help them scale and things like that. At 29, I left an unhealthy marriage with two small kids. And my ex-husband left us $2 million in debt. Now I'm 46 mm. now. It's been almost 20 years. And I remember sitting there thinking... 
you must really want me to um to really embody the experience when I help people. Mm. I'm like, this is just wild, mm. you know? Yeah. And people, and for anybody who ever feels like you're you're an you're an imposter, we get this this conversation a lot with clients, they feel like an imposter. I'm like, I could not feel more like an imposter helping people reorganize through chapter 11 while navigating my personal chapter seven. Not that I created it, someone else gifted it to me, but I had to navigate it nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that made me a stronger asset for my clients because it's one thing when you look at somebody who's three, five, ten, seven, you know, seven, ten million dollars in debt, and you tell them, I understand you, but it's a whole different ballgame. When you tell them, look, man, I understand you, I got you, I know exactly how you feel. And the person can look at you and see the reflection of their fear and their pain and their chaos in your eyes because you're feeling the same thing. You're just not putting on yourself on them. That creates a connection and a bond like nothing else. Wow. 24, you got that spark. Well, I've always had it. I was looking for my in. I just didn't know what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. I knew I'm here for something big, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something very significant. I didn't know what it is. So I always run around with my hand up saying, what about this? What about this? What about this? But right. Yeah. That's how it kind of started. No. So I'm saying, so 24. So, okay. Hand raised. You kind of, you, you went into the chapter, chapter four. Chapter personally. No, no, no. With the, the company. You were 24 uh, years old. Uh, chapter 11, reorganization. Chapter corporate. 11. Yeah. Oh, in that, was that the experience that sparked your passion for corporate restructuring and business transformation? Or did you have that prior to? Because that's pretty specific. Yeah, I always had, uh, I understand why kind of God placed me in this particular sphere is that I always understood people and money and every single mm. business, I don't care where you're at. I don't care what you're selling. It's really simple. It only consists of two main components, people and money. Yeah. Or just simplify it to the, to the bare bones that that's every single business without people and money. You don't have a business. People and I don't money. care how good you are. It doesn't matter. But I have a knack bringing, bringing chaos to order mm-hmm. instantly. Oh, wow. Instantly, I can walk into any business. I don't care what the debt, I don't care that the sky is falling. I instantly see a solution. I just have that natural ability. Right. So again, God's a funny guy. He just placed me where I'm good at. I can't explain it to you. I don't have a logical explanation. All right. So how do you help CEOs, you specifically like CEOs and entrepreneurs navigate through those financial chaos and avoid catastrophic failures. Mm-hmm. So the initial thing when you, there's multiple components. Number one, when you walk in, people are usually either running out of time or running out of money. Right. When you run out of either, or you're out of business, you either <laughs> run out of money to keep the doors open, or you run out of money. You run out of time to keep the doors open. Like you're done, or you <laughs> run out of money to keep paying to keep the doors open, whether Mm -hmm. it's employees, suppliers, whether it's delivering to clients, whatever it is. So usually people run out of time or run out out of money. Whichever one kind of the clocks runs out of first, that's what shuts the doors. So initially when I walk in, this isn't the time to redirect the the mindset of the the CEO and help them make better decisions. That's secondary because Mm -hmm. all of their decisions brought them to the bankruptcy. Okay. That's just the truth. Our decision, the, our balance sheet, our PNL is just a reflection of the decision making, the decisions the CEO makes on a daily basis. It's as simple as that, right? Mm-hmm. It's, somebody okay. has to run the company. But the initial, the initial, the, the starting point is to look at the entire situation mm-hmm. and to create time and money mm. instantly. Whether it's by creating time, you negotiate longer payment term with, terms with your suppliers. Right. Whether it's you got to delay some payments, whether it's renegotiate your contracts, going back to clients, say, hey, I know you gave you 60 day terms. I need to collect them in the next 10 days. If you want to take a, you know, a, a discount, you start playing with numbers and time. Mm-hmm. The, initial rea- the initial thing is to keep the doors open. Otherwise, nothing is going to matter. Right. Once that's in place... And that can be done really quickly at the pace that I move. But once that's in place, the main thing is, is to change the decision process of the CEO. Because me helping you and then I leave and you go back to where I found you, what's the point? Right. And the company is just 
a byproduct of the decision making abilities of the CEO. People think it's something so something magical out there. No, it's the decisions that you make. So there's a million moving pieces, but <clears throat> but the, the the first step, where are the bleeds, where are the problems, yeah. look at the cash, when are you gonna run out of time? How do we give you more time and more money? And then you start doing the dance between all of these moving pieces that are right. happening at the same time. What are some uh, common mistakes that you see CEOs or business businesses make and, and how can they be prevented? I know this is second because you're coming in in the, in the fire, in the chaos, but then you want to reshape mm -hmm. decision making. So what are some common things that you see that get them into these chaotic states? Or catastrophic no, three failures. Main things. I love this question because I think everybody needs to know this. Three main things. Number one, the needs of the company will always outgrow the knowledge of the CEO. Okay. The needs of the business will always outgrow the knowledge of the CEO. So what happens is the knowledge base of the CEO is right here, for example. The, no the max of the knowledge of the CEO is here. So they can take a company from zero and scale it up to where the knowledge is because that's easy. They know what to do in this gap, mm -hmm. but then they start to grow their business. And this is the, the spot that they actually miss. They start to grow the business past their knowledge base because they have the momentum. Yeah. Once it's hit a certain point and there is a gap between the knowledge and the needs of the company, the company starts to scale back, but the problem is it never stops at the knowledge now of the CEO. It mm. now scales way below it. And this creates the negative mm. because in the gap between the knowledge and where they've taken the company, they're making decisions now with incorrect information. Right. Or lack this is where it starts to happen. So the now the needs of the company will always outgrow the knowledge base of the CEO. So really it's important to be smart enough to know that we're not smart enough to know everything. Right. And that's the spot where people miss asking for help. Mm. A raise is saying, I need information because they, they're so excited in the process of the growth. They're not really catching the fact that 30, 60, 90 days from now, they're going to run, run out of information while delivering on orders and clients and all of the, and making yeah. deals. And then it, it's, it's just a bad deal. And by the way, over a hundred companies, the pattern is always the same. It's mm. not like about one or two, like it, the pattern is the same. So. The needs of the company will always have the knowledge of the CEO. The second thing is lack of infrastructure. Hmm. A lot of CEOs, and I'm talking about like under, so let's say under 15, 20 million dollar in annual revenue, is they hire multiple mistakes in a hiring process. They hire based on where they're at, and their going. team is <clears throat> never qualified at the next level because a lot of times it's financial resources. A lot of times what the CEOs will do, they will hire a book, mm -hmm. for example, that can basically do phenomenal data entry, but they have no idea how to read the numbers and tell the story that the numbers actually read. Mm -hmm. And the CEO has no idea. People mm -hmm. think CEO is the, the manager, is the, is the account, and is the CPA. Is the, no, they need qualified information. So putting a financial statement in front of CEO is one thing. Putting a financial state in front of CEO and saying, this is what's happening. This is the picture of the company, where we've been, where we are, where we're going is a whole different ballgame. Mm. So a lot of businesses, they do not have the proper infrastructure. So the CEO ends up being everything or a little bit of everything. Yeah. And the supports team is not able to take to sustain the next level. Right. Massive negative. And last thing, I mean, there's so many, but last thing that I've seen again, and I, it's all over the somebody's balance sheet. I can instantly spot this by looking at their balance sheet is emotional decisions. Mm. Emotional decisions are extremely expensive in business and in life. Right. In marriages and relationships, friendships, businesses, a lot of people make emotional decisions. So again, the outside support is required because the outside person, not can I, not can we only see the global picture, we can, we can take the emotional attachment out of it and logically say, this is a good move, this is a bad move, this is gonna cost you later, this is, when you're emotionally in it, you logic is out the door. Yeah. So the three main things is the needs of the company will always outgrow the knowledge base of the CEO, 
The next thing is lack of infrastructure because people hire for now and not for later. Mm -hmm. And the third is emotional decisions. And you can look at somebody's balance sheet and know exactly where all of those decisions were made or wow. where necessary decisions were not made. You gave a lot. Thank you. But the first one, so number one, you said the scale or the hiring, right? There's a flaw in hiring. And also there's a flaw. Well, no, the first one was there's a flaw in not knowing knowledge. to ask for help, right? The knowledge. How do you get someone to understand when to ask for help? When does a CEO need to check themselves to know that, okay, now I'm going into uncharted territory for my experience and my knowledge and I need help? Like, how do they figure that out? Because I don't, I don't even see how you would know to do that unless you just practice continuous learning the whole way, you know, throughout your career, which is smart anyway. But what, mm -hmm. what, what recommendation would you give? Easy. The first time you can't pay your payroll, ask for help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first time you can't cover your bills, ask for help. The first time if you're used to you have a pattern of paying everything on, on, on terms mm -hmm. and you're going out of terms, ask for help. Yeah. Raise your hand. You like, there is no, people think there is some sort of a reward for like, you don't need to be a hero. Ask for help. Nobody's going to mm. think less of you. And I got to tell you, I have noticed in my experience only that women ask for help faster than men mm -hmm. because the difference is with men, it's more of an ego. I, I'll get it done for women. We're wired for safety. The moment we feel unsafe, and our business is threatened, and this is how we feed our kids, and this is how we take care of, especially when I've worked with single moms who have business, like yeah. the moment something's wrong, they're like, I need help. Mm. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because they get they get back on track faster. Yeah. They're not accumulating a negative for the next, uh, until they've missed five payrolls. They, yes. you know, they ask for help faster. Mm. But how do you know you need help? The moment you can't pay your bills, it's as simple as that. Or you can't pay it based on the terms you've agreed upon. And if there is a pattern in your business of you being able to do certain things financially, and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute. Mm. I still have things to take care of and I'm out of cash somehow. It's time to ask for help. Right. That's a great answer. I'll tell you, that resonates. Thank you. So you came to the U.S. when you were 11? Mm-hmm. How mm -hmm. did how how did come in here so early? It probably was a, a little bit of a shock, maybe initially, and you had to you know get into the flow. But how did some of that experience and maybe the knowledge that you gained at that time influence your entrepreneurial journey? I don't know if being an immigrant has something to do with it, or the way that I was brought up. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a phenomenal businessman. Nice. Okay. And I was his, out of the four grandkids, for some reason, I was his everything. And I wasn't the first or the last grandkid. Yeah. And then my, my daughters ended up being his everything. So he really molded me his entire life in a business environment. Okay. But I think he did that because he saw that in me. He did yeah. that because he saw it in me. But I always had a hunger for life. Mm. I always knew that I came from a country where we did not have back when we left the opportunities. And I knew why my parents brought me here. Like that never escaped me. Okay. That I have a beautiful opportunity to tap into not just my God-given unlimited potential, but I'm in a place in a country where there is no limit. Why would I not take advantage of it? And for mm. some reason, I always grasped that concept. And I've made money since I was 11. Like I've always, I love working. Mm -hmm. It's not that I work because it, it's, it was never for me. Uh, I have to work to survive. Like I love, genuinely love what I do. So all Beautiful. of those moving pieces at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Now I'm going to shift back. What strategies do you use to help business leaders rediscover their purpose in like you, their potential? You know, I think for business leaders, once their company is on track, they can have more space and clarity to actually think about what they want to do or the direction they want to take the company. Because mm -hmm. the initial thing is, what do we have to do right now for you to actually have a business so you actually have money so you're not in survival mode? We can't decide. We don't have the luxury to decide on anything when we're in survival mode. We just got to plug the holes, keep yeah. the ship from sinking and go. But then I think ultimately it's making slight pivots and adjustments along the way. Mm -hmm. 
you know, pivots and adjustments. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of, it's a trial and error process. It's mm -hmm. never one thing. It's mm -hmm. a trial and error. And I think what I hope people is give themselves enough grace to go. They're like, I want to know now what's the thing. Well, you're not going to know what the thing is until you maybe try a hundred things and 99 of them go sideways. And you're like, okay, this one thing gets me so excited. So allow yourself the grace to, and I give, and I tell my, my clients, give yourself the grace. Like you don't have to make the decision right now for the rest of your life. And even if you make it, it's going to change later on as life, mm -hmm. evolution of life, evolution of you as a human being. So I think my also what I want them to do is to remember why they started their business to begin with. And mm. that usually really gets their heart, the blood pumping in their heart again. Right. They're like, I remember <clears throat> before there was stress and, and chaos and maybe I was, I felt stuck or stagnant, all of those things. But I remember why I started my business to begin with. And then you can just see them come alive. And by the way, as I watch them come alive, their financial statements begin to reflect it. Yeah, good, good. So you are super enthusiastic and passionate about what it is that you do. Do you ever get frustrated? Yes, yes, I get frustrated when people fight for their right to stay stuck. Mm. I get frustrated when people fight for their right to be mediocre. I get frustrated when it's so black and white. This is the problem. This is the solution. Let's combine a rock and roll. They're like, no, let me explore 50 million other options. I'm like, you're right. You're, it's costing mm. you money every time you don't make a decision. So those things get me frustrated. But I think what gets me the most is not even frustrated. I get really sad when people quit on themselves. Mm. I get really sad. I do work very closely with God. I believe we have unlimited potential and an unlimited source of abundance to tap into. Yeah. And when people quit on themselves, mm -hmm. that breaks my heart because I can, I have a gift of seeing what people are capable of and their potential. I can look at somebody and say, you're going to be good <clears> at this, <throat> this. And when I see, like, I know mm -hmm. they're, they're like half an inch away from mm. absolutely becoming the most magnificent version of themselves and their life will exponentially just blossom and they quit on themselves because the past pain, the past mistakes, the, the mm. past shame, all of that just consumes them. Wow. That's hard for me. Right. Because I've gone through that myself and I know what's on the other side of it. If yeah. you don't quit, I don't believe people fail. I genuinely don't believe people fail. I believe people quit on themselves. I've never seen anybody fail. It only fails when you quit on yourself. Maybe it's my grandfather. He always told me, you fall down, you get up, you do it again. Like, that's my mentality. So my mind doesn't process failure yeah. in any way, shape, or form. So watching people walk away mm -hmm. from themselves, not even, they think they're walking away from business or this. You're walking away from yourself. That, to me, is really hard, very hard to witness. And so how do you maintain your motivation and your passion for helping businesses and individuals? And, you, you know, you're going through, well, you've gone through and Nothing. everyone has their own challenges, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you maintain that motivation? I genuinely believe I'm doing God's will for my life. That's right. really the That's answer it. I can give you. And, you know, even in the worst of my times where I really just did not have it in me to get out of bed. And I believe my daughters were a big reason that I couldn't not get out of bed. Mm -hmm. because it was me 100% uh, financially responsible to support him. Um, every time where I feel like out of juice and mm -hmm. just out of life, out of energy, out of everything, first of all, my daughters were a massive motivator. But the moment I get on the phone with a client, the moment I walk into an office, I just come alive. Yeah. I just come. And I can walk out of the office and be ex back to being exhausted and and sad and depressed, whatever yeah. I'm going through in, in my life. But in that moment, something, it's like a switch. That's, that's just the best answer I can give you. That's just a switch. Right, right. Okay, I like it. What advice would you give someone facing a major career transition or business setback? And I know one is keep, keep going, listen to my advice, but give me, give me some advice you would uh, give to someone. Yeah, if you're going through a career transition, if you feel it's time to move, then move. Mm-hmm. If you're going through a career transition and you think, you know, a lot of people are waiting for the moment when it's comfortable, convenient, financially affordable, when it's less scary and all of those things, that moment's not coming. 
Yeah. I don't want to burst anybody's bubble. It's not coming. It's going to be hard. It's going to be scary. It's going to be expensive. You may lose some money. You may this, all of those. And I, I guess what I want to say is all the things you're afraid of, they're mm-hmm. probably going to happen. I'm mm. not going to, you know, it's the truth. Yeah. It's scary when you transition from one phase to another in life. Right. Do it anyways. Yeah. Do it anyways. In terms of business, when people are starting to, to kind of get into a hard spot, be aware of your decisions. If you're hitting a hard spot and you're still, uh, you know, driving this the, 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 this bus with the same decisions you you got them in a in a hard spot, change your decisions. You know, people think business is really really complicated. Mm-hmm. Business is not easy. Business is hard, but business is very simple. Our brain loves to complicate stuff. It's very simple. If you're seeing yourself in a hard in a hard spot. Mm-hmm. Those that's a byproduct of the decisions. So with decisions, and by the way, there's very often people can change their decisions instantly, even the small decisions that will make a massive difference. So look at your decisions, look at your, your look at the numbers, numbers tell a story. A lot of CEOs don't want to look at their financials if their life depended on it. By the way, surprise, your life does depend on it. <laughs> you have to, and not just look at them, you have to understand what they mean. And numbers very often will tell businesses ahead of time where they're heading, you know? Yeah. yeah. The numbers tell stories. So if you're starting to hit a, a spot where you, you, you're feeling uncomfortable with, with your financials and your business and things like that with the numbers because you're falling behind or whatever, what decisions are not serving you anymore? Maybe you're saying yes to clients you should no longer be saying yes to. Maybe the, the old payment terms are no longer profitable. You need to pull it forward. And this is where people are afraid. What if I upset my client? Upset your clients. You got to take mm. it first. What if you're taking old clients where the prices need to go up because of inflation and cost of employment and cost of all, all of that stuff. And you're afraid yeah. to raise prices because they're going to leave and they're a tiny margin. It's not even worth it for you. Let them go. Like that's okay. Mm. So we hold on to these things. It's all a decision, right? Yes. Let people go, bring new people in. It has business just like your life needs. You need to breathe new life into your business, just like you need to breathe new life into your, into your, into your life. Right. Well, so you talked a little bit about your, your divorce. So how have, you know, your personal experiences, including the challenging divorce. And that was a lot of money. I I let you just roll through that, that debt number. And I didn't, (laughs) I didn't follow up on it, but how did that shape your professional resilience? Like, did you, did you find something in you that you didn't know was there? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. You don't discover who you are until you go through the worst of times. Yeah. I don't know if God designed that on purpose. I don't know if we're just too stubborn to really tap into our full potential without hard, hard times because we're just kind of cruising along through, along through life, you know, blowing through life like everything is great without really realizing. But I really discovered what I made out of. Yeah. I really, there is zero chance in this life I would discover how resilient I am, how strong I am, how responsible I am, how committed I am. My capacity now, this isn't just right $2 million, but that's almost 20 years ago. Yeah. You can double it now. 29, two kids, three, three and 10 at that time, really aggressive divorce, multiple restraining order, threats on my life, threats of kidnapping my kids. I mean, this wasn't a walk in the park. Right. This didn't just happen. This was a three year of hell. I was in hell while navigating five, seven, 12 companies through their own hell at the same time. And completely responsible for two kids. And my kids weren't just in schools. Like there was no TV and doing nothing at the house. They were in sports and activities five to six to seven days a week sometimes. Yeah. Like I was that parent. I was on 24 seven. But to discover what I'm capable of, I realized mm-hmm. that nothing is a problem unless it's an actual problem because I've gone through problems. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. as long as my kids and I are okay, nothing is a problem. It's just a minor temporary inconvenience. Mm-hmm. Because once you get gone through real problems in your life, you realize that very few pro- actual problems exist and they only happen when it comes to health of, the, of yours and of you and people you actually love, you know, that are, that are close to yeah. you. That's yeah. it. Nothing else is a problem. So I think it gave me, it made me stronger in turnaround because when I didn't really think anything was a problem before, now I really didn't think anything was a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I could navigate anything. I was always the negotiator on deck. I'm really good at negotiating. I could do all of it. 
but I also see why God gave me that experience. Mm -hmm. My resiliency is unstoppable. And when I talk to people and tell them, I know we're going to do this, we're going to scale or we're going to reorganize whatever. And I know you can do this. I say this with such conviction. They have no other choice but to believe me. Hmm. But I remember it was a very scary time. I remember no matter how much money I made, I was out of money and couldn't afford to feed all three of us at the same time because I was trying to navigate and pay everything off. When I finally said, this is lunacy. Like I got to file a chapter seven. Like I don't need to be a hero here. Yeah. United States provides a fantastic tool of bankruptcy. I didn't do any of this. So this was gifted to me. Why am I fighting this Goliath if I can just file in it and go back to being sane and being present for my kids and not have to, I literally had to skip meals because it didn't matter how much I made. I would try to, it wouldn't matter. I could have Mm -hmm. made, you know. So I think that experience, um, but the last thing I want to say to this is, I think people undervalue their hard experiences Mm. and under leverage their hard experiences. I lit that thing on fire. I was like, let's, I'm going to let people stand in my experience when they're going through theirs. And that experience actually brought me to God. And what also helps when you have the, the, the experience that I have and the, the, the strength of faith that I have is when people are navigating through hard times and it doesn't have to be corporate restructuring. People are people. They all have problems. Yeah. When I work with people and they see my level of what I've gone through and my resilience and my faith, I often tell them, I know you're losing faith. Mine is strong enough to support both of us. You, you mm. can stand on mine now until we get yours back. Mm. So when I look back at all of my life, all of the experiences, uh, it all brought, it all not just served me, but it serves so many people now. Yeah. So I'm grateful beautiful. for it. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I appreciate you. Do you have a company? What is your, what is your company called? Just my name. It's under my name. So that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Okay. And what do, what do you provide? Is it only just for CEOs, corporate businesses and restructuring and scaling? Or do you have any other um, specialties that you that you work on as well? Yeah, uh, special, I mean, special uh, scaling, restructuring, <laughs> business is business, right? It's money and people. It's all the same. You know, a lot of people come to me for personal development. Mm. A lot of people come to me for person. I'm very good with people. It's just not that I'm kind of uh, patting myself in the back. That's just the, the feedback I've gotten from people over the years. I have a gift to activate people into their highest potential. So okay. even when working with the CEOs, a lot of it is personal development. Mm. A lot of it's higher, high achievers come to me when they want to break into the next level. They're like, where am I stuck? Cause I can take my, take everything out and just see really clearly what's happening. And so personal development that I'm being a big and people just literally hire me on contracts just for that they have me look at their businesses but they're like i'm ready to be bigger and go just bolder within myself Mm -hmm. high performers Mm -hmm. where what am i missing where do i need to shift where do i need to adjust what do i need to change what do i need to correct and then ultimately like it or not it still impacts their business in the best possible way because they're becoming a whole different human being so kind of life and business but it goes together Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We work together. We can't so, change business if, if we don't kind of change you. And once you're changed, the business naturally evolves as well. You rescue people. You rescue businesses. What if you had someone who was just starting a business and they're like, you know what? Mm-hmm. I need some insight before I jump yeah. into this. And mm-hmm. I believe Regina can help me out with that. Is yeah. that something that you take on? Absolutely. I work with also with a lot of online entrepreneurs, a lot of in-service providers, people like that. They don't necessarily need rescue. They just want to scale. They feel like right. they've done the most they could with the information that they have, but they want to scale and we take them to the next level and I help them get to the next level and that's it. Okay. Business is business. It's all business. strategy. I like that. You're the one. So I'm <laughs> sure that I haven't asked a question, right? Or covered everything. So is there something that we haven't talked about today that you like to discuss or bring up that I haven't asked you? I think we've covered it all. I think it all, maybe the question of where does it all stop and where does it all, where does it begin and where does it stop? And I think, you know, the buck always stops with you. Mm-hmm. The, buck always, mm-hmm. the buck always stops with you. I think the people that I've seen do the best in business and in life, where do not, they don't play the victim card mm. and they all take complete responsibility for mm. everything happening in their life. 
you know, how things are different. I don't want to touch the subject. That's a whole different conversation. I don't have an explanation for that, of course. But people who have taken, whether they're scaling, restructuring, whether they're hiring for personal development, they're navigating some certain things, or whether they just want to grow. When people say, I'm responsible for everything in my life and my business, that statement is going to be your rocket fuel for your life and for your business. There are people who the customers suck, the vendors suck, the employees are too lazy, all of that stuff. Listen, you, you signed the contract with that client, you hired those employees, you made the deals with your vendors. Let, let's call it what it is. And I, mm. and I say it straight up to the client, like I'm sugar coating is not my thing. I just don't have the energy or the patience for that. When you really take 100% responsibility and accountability for everything in your life, absolute rocket fuel. You will go faster than you can imagine. Yeah. Bring it all back to yourself because that that's the origin of it all. Mm. Amazing. That, that's awesome. Thank you again. I'm always saying you got a lot of things and you simplify. You said it's, it's really simple. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but it's not complicated. I love mm -hmm. that, that messaging. Just bring it back to the simplicity of it all. With that being said, thank you, Regina. How can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your work or even connect to, to, you know, get a consult or something with you? Absolutely. So on my website, there is a link for a 30 minute free consultation. Please uh, come like I don't hard sell on my services or anything in the consultations. To be honest with you, I often don't even mention that people ask me at the end, how can I work with you? Mm -hmm. It's really a time for you to ask me anything you want to ask me about your business or you where you want to go, where you've come from. Any of that stuff is on my website, reginaglobinas.com or uh, social media, send me a message on LinkedIn and Facebook. I mean, again, I keep things stupid simple. I couldn't make it any simpler for, for myself. I, I hate complicating anything. And I teach people literally how to simplify and then scale at speed because you cannot scale a rocket science project. You want things to be simple. Are there any other people like you? You seem like a unicorn. You're saying, uh, a, <laughs> lot of, you're saying a lot of things that make absolute sense. You're getting to the issues, you're getting to the, you know, resolutions to problems instantly or quickly, right? You, you have a knack for it. You have a God given gift for it. Do you think there's any other people that has a similar skill set or ability for lack of better words that you do? I'm just curious. I believe so. What I realized with people like me is we may not be the best and the loudest at selling ourselves on social media and things like that because mm. we support the work. Like I am not the best. I help my clients sell out their top tier offers, their top tier services, their top tier products, everything. Yeah. But I'm not the best at being loud about myself, for example, on social media. So there is a lot of us, but we're just quieter because we're just focused on doing the work. But I'm sure there is a lot of brilliant men and women out there who do, who do the work. Yeah, I, I believe so. I've met a lot of them. We're just quieter. I love, I love your energy. I love your message. I was taking notes. So if you was wondering what I was doing, writing a few things down, because some of the things that you said actually resonated with me. Yes. So that's why I was a lot of thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because it actually resonated. And hopefully it resonated for the, the listeners as well. So Regina, thank you for sharing your incredible journey and your insights with uh, with me today, your experiences in transforming businesses and guiding individuals toward their highest potential have been truly inspiring. And for our listeners, Make sure to tune in and subscribe to Hindsight the Podcast so you won't miss any future episodes. And thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to having you back soon. Thanks, Regina. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Hey, thanks for joining me here on Hindsight the Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know I did. And while I have you here, why don't you take your mouse and go over and click on that subscribe button? No, no, not right there. Over to the right. T no, no, down, down, right, right there. Boom. Thank you. Now, thank you for subscribing to Hindsight the Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones.